Hi again. <clears throat> I, um, I felt like making another video tonight because I forgot to see what time it is, but I think it's only about half eleven. Um, I've been really unproductive today. Uh, well, no, I've been really unproductive. I know I'm supposed to do some uni work, but I'm not really enjoying anything that isn't my own kind of self-led songwriting stuff um, at the minute. Uh, I'm supposed to be working on something that's still pretty self-led, but it's just, I don't know, I'm just really interested in letters at the minute and kind of getting bored of just kind of traditional drawing. Um, people have been asking to see some of the art I've done lately and I probably will show you that in another episode um, I haven't really like, gathered I've got a lot of stuff kind of on the walls and everything but um, it will be not safe for work um, whenever I do post that but yeah I, I'm supposed to be working on a kind of comic book or series of prints based around Robert Johnson's life and his kind of career and short-lived career and his kind of mysterious death and that whole theory that he met the devil at some crossroads in Mississippi um, and sold his soul in exchange for basically the ability of being the best blues musician in the world. Um, yeah, it, it, I kind of chose that, that's not what other people are doing at all, it's my own thing, but it's just not really, I'm not motivated for that at the minute. And then I kind of decided today I need to sit down and do that and can't just keep working on my own songwriting stuff because even though that is actually what I need to be practicing on it's what I'm going to do next year and what I hope to kind of make a career out of. I have this project and I need to do the project so I can carry on at uni. But yeah, I just didn't really go to bed. Um, so I've kind of done nothing. I went for a 5k and ended up running a little bit more. Um, did like a little workout at home. I ate a lot of protein pancakes <laughs> and that's pretty much all I've done. Um, I have actually been researching kind of the prices for flights and accommodation like Airbnbs and stuff in Brooklyn because I'm going to apply for two separate bursaries or grants with my university. One of them you need um, a kind of plan of what you want to do when you're there. Um, but it has to be something that's like an actual course that's happening there or work experience or a placement or something and I'm struggling to kind of find something sang related in Brooklyn around the time I'm going um, but yeah, I'm going to apply for that anyway and the other one it's a little bit looser as long as you just have a solid reason for needing to go why it relates to your third year studies um, an itinerary and everything like that and a reason for why you need the bursary which I do because I don't have £1,000 spare um, um, but the only problem is that there's only one per university so I have been like looking at and kind of compiling some stuff together for the um, proposals for those today but that's pretty much it um, so I thought I'd try to get something done so I thought I'd make another video. Um, last time I read the first chapter of Lolita. So I was just looking out my window and I was thinking I might just carry on reading that. Um, if you didn't watch the last video, I knew if you did, chapter one's so small I might as well read it again. Uh, so. I say to make a nail tapping video. Yeah, it 
then you're reading the letter. <clears throat> so it's by Vladimir Nabokov. Let's go. Lalita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul. Lolita, the tip of the tongue taking a trip for three steps down the palate to tap the three on the teeth. Lolita. She was low, playing low in the morning, seven four feet ten in one sock. She was Lola in slacks. She was Dolly at school. She was Dolores on the dotted line. But in my arms, she was always Lolita. Did she have a precursor? She did, indeed she did. In point of fact, there might have been no Lolita at all had I not loved one summer a certain initial girl child in a Princeton by the sea. Or when, about as many years before Lolita was born as my age was that summer. You can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit number one is what the seraphs, the misinformed, simple, noble-winged seraphs envied. Look at this tangle of thorns. I was born in 1910 in Paris. My father was a gentle, easy-going person, a salad of racial genes, a Swiss citizen of mixed French and Austrian descent with a dash of the Danube in his veins. I'm going to pass around in a minute some lovely, glossy blue picture postcards. He owned a luxurious hotel on the Riviera. His father and two grandfathers had sold wine, jewels and silk respectively. At 30, he married an English girl, daughter of Jerome Dunn, the alpinist, and granddaughter of two Dorset Parsons, experts in obscure subjects, paleopodology and Aeolian harps respectively. My very photogenic mother died in a freak accident, picnic, lighting, lightning, when I was three and save for a pocket of warmth from the darkest past. Nothing of her subsists within the hollows and dells of memory, over which, if you can still stand my style, I am writing under observation, the sun of my infancy had set. Surely you all know those redolent remnants of days suspended, with the midges about some hedge in bloom, or suddenly entered and traversed by the rambler at the bottom of a hill in the summer dusk. A furry warmth, golden midges. My mother's eldest sister, Sybil, whom a cousin of my father's had married and then neglected, served in my immediate family as a kind of unpaid governess and housekeeper. Somebody told me later that she had been in love with my father and that he had light heartedly taken advantage of it one rainy day and forgotten it by the time the weather cleared. I was extremely fond of her, despite the rigidity the fatal rigidity of some of her rules. Perhaps she wanted to make of me, in the fullness of time, a better widower than my father. Aunt Sybil had pink-rimmed azure eyes and a waxen complexion. She wrote poetry. She was poetically superstitious. She said she knew she would die soon after my 17th birthday, and did. 16th. Her husband, a great traveller in perfume, spent most of his time in America, where eventually he founded a firm and acquired a bit of real estate. I grew a he happy, healthy child in a bright world of illustrated books, clean sand, orange trees, friendly dogs, sea vistas and smiling faces. Around me the splendid Hotel Murano evolved as a kind of private universe a whitewashed cosmos within the blue greater one that blazed outside. From the apparent pot scrubber to the flannel potentate, everybody liked me, everybody petted me. Elderly American ladies leaning on their canes listed toward me like towers of Pisa. Ruined Russian princesses who could not pay my father bought me expensive bonbons. He, mon cher petit papa. Oh, I forgot there's Frenchness. Oh no, okay, we'll give it a go. Took me out boating and biking, taught me to swim and dive and water ski, read to me Don Quixote, lovely, and Le Les Miserables. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
and I adored and respected him and felt glad for him whenever I overheard the servants discuss his various lady friends, beautiful and kind beings who made much of me and cooed and shed precious tears over my cheerful motherlessness. motherlessness. I attended an English day school a few miles from home and there I played rackets and fives and got excellent marks and was on perfect terms with schoolmates and teachers alike. The only definite sexual events that I can remember as having occurred before my 13th birthday, that is, before I first saw my little Annabelle, were a solemn, decorous and purely theoretical talk about pubertal, pubertal surprises in the rose garden of a school with an American kid, the son of a then celebrated motion picture actress whom he seldom saw in the three-dimensional world, and some interesting reactions on the part of my organism to certain photographs, pearl and umbra with infinitely soft partings in Pichon's sumptuous La Beauté of Mine that I had filched from under a mountain of marble-bound graphics in the hotel library. Later, in his delightful debonair manner, my father gave me the all, all the information he thought I needed about sex. This was just before sending me, in the autumn of 1923, to a lycée in Lyon, where we were to spend three winters. But alas, in the summer of that year, he was touring Italy with Mamma de R and her daughter, and I had nobody to complain to, nobody to consult. Chapter 3. Sorry, I forgot to say chapter 2. Annabelle was, like the writer, of mixed parentage, half English, half Dutch in her case. I remember her features far less distinctly today than I did a few years ago before I knew Lolita. There are two kinds of visual memory. One when you skillfully recreate an image in the laboratory of your mind with your eyes open. And then I see Annabelle in such general terms as honey coloured skin, thin arms, brown barbed hair, long lashes, big bright mouth. And the other when you instantly evoke with shut eyes on the dark inner side of your eyelids the objective absolutely optical rep replica of a beloved face, a little ghost in natural colours. And this is how I see Lilita. Let me therefore primly limit myself in describing Annabelle, to saying she was a lovely child a few months my junior. Her parents were old friends of my aunt's and as stuffy as she. They had rented a villa not far from Hotel Morano, Bold brown Mr. Lay and fat powdered Mrs. Lay, born Vanessa Van Ness. How I loathed them. At first, Annabelle and I talked of peripheral affairs. She kept lifting handfuls of fine sand and letting it pour through her fingers. Her brains were turned the way those of intelligent European pre adolescents were in our day and set, and I doubt if much individual genius should be assigned to her interest in the plurality of inhabited worlds, competitive tennis, infinity, solipsism, and so on. The softness and fragility of baby animals causes the same intense pain. She wanted to be a nurse in some famished Asiatic country. I wanted to be a famous spy. All at once we were madly, clumsily, shamelessly, agonisingly in love with each other. Hopelessly, I should add, because that frenzy of mutual possession might have been assuaged only by our actually imbibing and assimilating every particle of each other's soul and flesh. But there we were, unable even to mate as some children would have so easily found an oppo opportunity to do. After one wild attempt we made to meet we made to meet at night in her garden, of which more later, the only privacy we were allowed was to be out of earshot but not out of sight on the populous part of the plage. plage. There, on the soft sand, a few feet away from our elders, we would sprawl all morning in a petrified paroxysm of desire and take advantage of every blessed quirk in space and time to touch each other. Her hand, half hidden in the sand, would creep toward me, its slender brown fingers sleepwalking nearer and nearer. Then, as her opalescent knee would start on a long, cautious journey, sometimes a chance from part built by younger children, granted us sufficient concealment to graze each other's salty lips. These incomplete contacts drove our healthy and inexperienced young bodies to 
such a state of exploration that not even the cold blue water under which we still clawed at each other could bring relief. Among some treasures I lost during the wanderings of my adult years, there was a snapshot taken by my aunt which showed Annabelle, her parents and the staid elderly lame gentleman, a Dr. Cooper, Twin Peaks, who that same summer courted my aunt, grouped on a table in a sidewalk cafe. Annabelle did not come out well, caught as she was in the act of bending over her chocolat glass. I really can't Just pronounce any French. And her thin bare shoulders and the parting in her hair were about all that could be identified as I remember that picture, amid the sunny blur into which she, her lost loveliness graded. But I, sitting somewhat apart from the rest, came out with a kind of dramatic conspicuousness. A moody, beetle browed boy in a dark sports shirt and well tailored white shorts, his legs crossed, sitting in public in profile, looking away. That photograph was taken on the last day of our fatal summer, and just a few minutes before we made our second and final attempt to thwart fate. Under the flimsiest of pretexts, this was our very last chance and nothing really mattered, we escaped from the calf to the beach and found a desolate stretch of sand, and there, in the violet shadow of some red rocks forming a kind of cave, had a brief session of arid caresses with somebody's lost pair of sunglasses, her only witness. I was on my knees and on the point of possessing my darling when two bearded bathers, the old man of the sea and his brother, came out of the sea with exclamations of ribald encouragement, and four months later she died of typhus in Corfu. Chapter 4 <clears throat> I leaf again and again through these miserable memories, and keep asking myself, was it then, in the glitter of that remote summer, that the rift in my life began? Or was my excessive desire for that child only the first evidence of an inherent singularity? When I try to analyse my own cravings, motives, actions and so forth, I surrender to a sort of retrospective imagination which feeds the analytic faculty with boundless alternatives, and which causes each visualised route to fork and refork without end in the maddeningly complex prospect of my past. I am convinced, however, that in a certain magic and fateful way, Lolita began with Annabelle. I also know that the shock of Annabelle's death consolidated the frustration of that nightmare, made of it a permanent obstacle to any further romance throughout the cold years of my youth. The spiritual and the physical had been blended in, had been blended in us, with a perfection that must remain incomprehensible to the matter-of-fact, crude, standard-brained youngsters of today. Long after her death, I felt her thoughts through, floating through mine. Long before we met, we had had the same dreams. I compared notes. We found strange affinities. The same June of the same year, 1919, a stray canary had fluttered into her house and mine in two widely separated countries. Oh, Lolita, had you loved me thus? I reserved the conclusion of my Annabelle phase the account of our unsuccessful first tryst. One night, she managed to deceive the vicious vigilance of her family. In a nervous and slender-leaved mimosa grove at the back of their villa, we found a perch on the ruins of a low stone wall. Through the darkness and the tender trees we could see the arabesques of lighted windows which, touched up by the coloured inks of sensitive memory, appear to me now like playing cards, presumably because a bridge game was keeping the enemy busy. She trembled and twitched as I kissed the, cord kissed the corner of her parted lips and the hot lobe of her ear. A cluster of stars pale gl palely glowed above us, between the silhouettes of long thin leaves. That vibrant sky seemed as naked as she was under her light frock. I saw her face in the sky, strangely distinct, as if it emitted a faint radiance of its own. Her legs, her lovely live legs, were not too close together, and when my hand located what it sought, a dreamy and airy expression, half pleasure, half pain, came over those childish features. She sat a little higher than I, 
and whenever in her solitary ecstasy when she was led to kiss me, her head would bend with a sleepy, soft, drooping movement that was almost woeful, and her bare knees caught and compressed my wrist and slackened again, and her quivering mouth, distorted by the acridity of some mysterious potion, with a sibilant intake of breath, came near to my face. She would try to relieve the pain of love by first roughly rubbing her dry lips against mine, then my darling would draw her away with the nervous toss of her hair, and then again come darkly near and let me feed on her open mouth, while with a generosity that was ready to offer her everything, my heart, my throat, my entrails, I gave her to hold in her awkward fist the scepter of my passion. <laughs> it's not all like this. <laughs> I recall the scent of some kind of toilet powder. I believe she stole it from her mother's Spanish maid, a sweetish, lowly, musky perfume. Hmm. It mingled with her own biscuity odour, and my senses were suddenly filled to the brim. A sudden commotion in the nearby bush prevented them from overflowing, and as we drew away from each other, and with aching veins attended to what was probably a prowling cat, there came from the house her mother's voice calling her, with a rising, frantic note, and Dr. Cooper ponderously limped out into the garden. But that mimosa grows, grove, the haze of stars, the tingle, the flame, the honeydew, and the ache remained with me, and that little girl with her seaside limbs and ardent tongue haunted me ever since. Until at last, 24 years later, I broke her spell by, incarn by incarnating her in another. Chapter 5 The days of my youth, as I look back on them, seem to fly away from me in a flurry of pale repetitive scraps like those morning sto snowstorms of used tissue paper that a train passenger sees whirling in the wake of the observation car. In my sanitary relations with women I was practical, ironical and brisk. While a college student in London and Paris, paid ladies sufficed me. My studies were meticulous and intense, although not particularly fruitful. At first I planned to take a degree in psychiatry, and as many monk talents do, but I was even more monk monke than that. A peculiar exhaustion. I'm so oppressed, doctor, set in, and I switched to English literature. 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 Am I saying? English literature. <laughs> I feel like I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> With so many frustrated poets and as pipe smoking teachers and tweeds. Paris suited me. I discussed Soviet movies with expatriates. I sat with the Uranists in the do, in the do my God. I published tortuous essays in obscure journals. I composed pastiches. Frau Lein von Krupp may turn her hand upon the door. I will not follow her, follow her, nor Fesca, nor that girl. A paper of mine entitled The Proustian Theme in a letter from Keats to Benjamin Bailey was chuckled over by the six or seven scholars who read it. I launched upon an histoire abrégé, abrégé de la poésie anglaise for a prominent publishing firm, and then started to compile that manual of French literature for English-speaking students, with comparisons drawn from the English writers, which was to occupy me throughout the 40s, and the last volume of which was almost ready for press by the time of my arrest. I found a job teaching English to a group of adults in Autoile, then a school for boys employed me for a couple of winters. Now and then I took advantage of the acquaintances I'd formed among social workers and psychotherapists to visit and accompany various institutions, such as orphanages and reform schools, where pale pubescent girls with matted eyelashes could be stared at in perfect impunity and mindful of that granted one in dreams. Now I wish to introduce the following idea. Between the age limits of 9 and 14, there occur maidens who, to certain bewitched travellers twice or many times older than they, reveal their true nature, which is not human, but nymphic, that is, demonic. And these chosen creatures I propose to designate as nymphettes. It will be marked that I substitute time terms for spatial ones. In fact, I would have the reader see 9 and 14 as the boundaries the mirrory beaches and rosy rocks of an enchanted island haunted by the, those nymphettes of mine and surrounded by a vast misty sea. 
Between those age limits, are all girl children known pets? Of course not. Otherwise, we who are in the know, we lone voyagers, we nymphalettes, would have long gone insane. Neither are good looks any criterion, and vulgarity, or at least what a given community terms so, does not necessarily impair certain mysterious characteristics. The fey grace, the elusive, shifty, soul-shattering, insidious charm that separates the nymphette from such girls as of hers are as incomparably more dependent on the spatial world of synchronous phenomena than on that intangible island of entranced time where Lolita plays with her likes. Within the same age limits, the number of true nymphettes is strikingly inferior to that of provisionally plain or just nice or cute or even sweet and attractive, ordinary, plumpish, formless, cold-skinned, essentially human little girls with tummies and pigtails who may or may not turn into adults of great beauty. Look at the um ugly dumplings in black stockings and white hats that are metamorphosed into stunning stars of the screen. A normal man given a group photograph of schoolgirls or girl scouts and asked to point out the comeliest one would not necessarily choose the nymphette among them. You have to be an artist and a madman, a creature of infinite melancholy, with a bubble of hot poison in your loins and a super voluptuous flame permanently aglow in your subtle spine. Oh, how you have to cringe and hide, in order to discern at once, by ineffable signs, the slightly feline outline of a cheekbone, the slenderness of a downy limb, and other indices which, which despair and shame and tears of tenderness forbid me to tabulate the little deadly demon among the wholesome children. She stands unrecognised by them and unconscious herself of her fantastic power. Furthermore, since the idea of time plays such a magic part in the matter, the student should not be surprised to learn that there must be a gap of several years, never less than ten, I should say, generally thirty or forty, and as many as ninety in a few known cases, between maiden and man, to enable the latter to come under an infant spell. It is a question of focal adjustment, of a certain distance that the inner eye thrills to surmount, and a certain contrast that the mind perceives with a gasp of first delight. When I was a child, and she was a child, my little Annabelle was no nymphette to me. I was her equal, a fawnlet in my own right, on that same enchanted island of time. But today, in September 1952, after 29 years have elapsed, I, I think I can distinguish in her the initial fateful elf in my life. No one, oh, mm, one thing. We loved each other with a premature love, marked by a fierceness that so often destroys adult lives. I was a strong lad and survived, but the poison was in the wound, and the wound remained ever open, and soon I found myself maturing amid a civilization which allows a man of twenty-five to court a girl of sixteen, but not a girl of twelve. No wonder, then, that my adult life, that my adult life during the European period of my existence proved monstrously twofold. Overtly, I had so-called normal relationships with a number of terrestrial women having pumpkins or pears for breasts. Inly, I was consumed by a hell of finesse, of localised lust for every passing nymphette whom as a law-abiding poltroon I never dared approach. The human females I was allowed to wield were but palliative agents. I am ready to believe that the sensations I derived from natural fornication were much the same as those known to normal big males consorting with their normal big mates in that routine rhythm that shakes the world. The trouble was that those gentlemen had not, and I had, caught glimpses of an incomparably more poignant kiss. The dimmest of my polluted dreams was a thousand times more dazzling than all the adored to be the most virile writer of genius, or the most talented impotent might imagine. My world was split. 
I was aware of not one, but two sexes, neither of which was mine. Both would be termed female by the anatomist, but to me, through the prism of my senses, they were as different as mist and mast. All this I rationalised rationalized now. In my twenties and early thirties, in my twenties and early thirties, I did not understand my throes quite so clearly. While my body knew what it craved for, my mind rejected my body's every plea. One moment I was ashamed and frightened, another recklessly optimistic. Taboo strangulated me. Psychoanalyst wound me with pseudo liberations of pseudo libidos. The fact that to me the only objects of amorous tremor were sisters of Anna Rose, her handmaids and girl pages, appeared to me at times as a forerunner of insanity. At other times I told myself that it was all a question of attitude. There was really nothing wrong in being moved to distraction by girl children. Let me remind my reader that in England, with the passage of the Children and Young Person Act in 1933, the term girl child is defined as a girl who is over 8 but under 14 years. After that, from 14 to 17, the statutory definition is a young person. In Massachusetts US, on the other hand, a wayward child is technically one between 7 and 17 years of age, who moreover habitually associates with vicious or immoral persons. Hugh Broughton, a writer of controversy in the reign of James I, has proved that Rahab was a harlot at ten years of age. This is all very interesting, and I dare say you see me already frothing at the mouth in a fit, but no, I am not. I am just winking happy thoughts into a little tiddle cup. Here are some more pictures. Here is Virgil, who could the nymphette sing in single tone, but probably preferred a lad's perineum. Here are two of King Acnathans and Queen Nefertiti's prenubal Nile daughters, that royal couple had a litter of six, wearing nothing but many necklaces of bright beads, relaxed on cushions, intact after three thousand years, with their soft brown puppy bodies, cropped hair and long ebony eyes. Here are some brides of ten compelled to seat themselves on the fascinum, the vir virile ivory in the temples of classical scholarship. Marriage and cohabitation before the age of puberty are still not unco uncommon in certain East Indian provinces. Lecture old men of 80 copulate with girls of 8 and nobody minds. After all, Dante fell madly in love with his Beatrice when she was 9, a sparkling girline, painted and lovely and bejeweled in a crimson frock, and this was in 1274 in Florence at a private feast in the merry month of May. And when Petrarch fell madly in love with his Lorene, she was a fair-haired nymphette of twelve, running in the wind, in the pollen and dust, a flower in flight, in the beautiful plain as descreed from the hills of Vaucluse. But let us be prim and civilised. Humbert Humbert tried hard to be good. Really and truly, he did. He had the utmost respect for ordinary children, for their purity and vulnerability, and under no circumstances would he have interfered with the innocence of a child if there was the least risk of a row. But how his heart beat when, among the innocent throng, he espied a demon child, en fond charmant that form. Dim eyes, bright lips, ten years in jail if you only show her you are looking at her. So life went. Humbert was perfectly capable of intercourse with Eve, but it was Lilith he longed for. The bud stage of breast development appears early, 10.7 years in the sequence of somatic changes accompanying, pubi accompanying pubescence, and the next maturational item available is the first appearance of pigmented pubic hair, 11.2 years. My little cup brings with tittles. A shipwreck, an atoll, alone with a drowned passenger's chip shivering child. Darling, this is only a game. How marvellous were my fancied adventures as I sat on a hard park bench, pretending to be immersed in a trembling book. Around the quiet scholar, nymphettes played freely, as if he were a familiar statue, or part of an old tree's shadow and sheen. Once, a perfect little beauty in a tartan frock with a clatter, 
with her heavily armed foot near me upon the bench, to dip her slim bare arms into me and tighten the strap of her roller skate, and I dissolved in the sun with my book for fig leaf, as her auburn ringlets fell all over her skinned knee, and the shadow of leaves I shared pulsated and melted on her radiant limb next to my chameleonic cheek. Another time, a red-haired schoolgirl hung over me in the metro, and a revelation of auxiliary auxiliary russet I obtained remained in my blood for weeks. I could list a great number of these one-sided, diminutive romances. Some of them ended in a rich flavour of hell. It happened, for instance, that from my balcony I would notice a lighted window across the street and what looked like a nymphette in the act of undressing before a cooperative mirror. Thus isolated, thus removed, the vision acquired an especially keen charm that made me race with all speed toward my own gratification. But abruptly, fiendishly, the tender pattern of nudity I had adored would be transformed into the disgusting, lamp-lit, bare arm of a man in his underclothes, reading his paper by the open window in the hot, damp, hopeless summer night. Rope skipping, hopscotch, that old woman in black who sat down next to me on my bench, on my rack of joy, an infect was groping under me for a lost marble, and asked if I'd stomachache the insolent hag. Ah, leave me alone in my pubescent park, in my mossy garden. Let them play around me forever. Never grow up. Okay, I've been recording for a long time, so I'm going to leave that there. Um, I'm sorry for the noises from outside. Because it's a um, single glazed window, you can hear everything. But yeah, that's all for today. If you want me to read more Lolita, um, I might do. I kind of forgot how kind of not safe for work and controversial it is. Um, obviously, it's a really controversial book and it's been banned by a lot of um, like schools and everything. So. It's not for everybody, but it's, if you look at it just purely from a kind of literary perspective, it's really good. But yeah, it's just up to you whether you want me to continue or not. Um, yeah, I learned it.